LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome to this 200th edition of LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and I'm delighted to be with you four and a half years down this weird and wonderful road. I have many fascinating guests lined up for the autumn, the winter and beyond and going forward I'd very much like to further develop the website. If you'd like to support my work please make your way to LegalizeFreedom.com that's Legalize-Freedom.com where you'll find a donate page or alternatively, drop me a line via the About page, which has contact details. For this 200th anniversary show, I'm pleased to welcome back Thomas Sheridan. Thomas has done several shows here over the years, including shows 100 and 101, so it seems only fitting to have him joining us again today. In the first part of a two-part programme, we'll be discussing Thomas's latest book, The Druid Code, Magic, Megalus and Mythology. The Druid Code sets out to examine the wider concept of magic and mythology being utilised as an early form of social psychoanalysis by the Druids, how magic theory developed from this, and how this evolution of ritual magic eventually made its way into folklore, witchcraft and Freemasonry. From the proto-shamanic world of the megalith builders to lost civilizations of the Atlantic fringe, Along with the continual changes and challenges to the human experience in the face of traumatic cultural upheaval, the Druids and their legacy have played a far more influential role than has been previously acknowledged. The Druid Code utilises mythology connected to sacred sites, developing a bi-directional conduit back through time to reveal what took place in 2500 BC, a shift in human consciousness that made humans what we are today. Issues discussed include the true meaning and purpose of mythology, our pathological tendency to regard our ancient ancestors as inferior, the power of symbolism to preserve and transmit archetypal ideas down the ages, do the stones of sacred megalithic sites possess special electromagnetic properties, does stone have a memory, the effects of modern architecture on the human psyche, and can radio waves and others beyond the spectrum of our five senses allow access to a spirit world. From Atlantis to alchemy, you will never see history in the same way again. Hello and welcome, Thomas, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Oh, I'm delighted to be back, Greg. Thanks for having me. Thomas, believe it or not, this is episode 200 legalizefreedom.com and it was you who de- did episode 100 in fact both episodes 100 and 101 and here we are 100 episodes later well i'm proud to be a calendar mark <laughs> <laughs> yes if, if nothing else i'm sure there's some kind of significance in all that but uh, today we're going to be talking about your latest book it's entitled the druid code magic megalus and mythology the usual drill here is i ask my guests just to give uh, listeners who don't know a little bit about your personal background, your work background, um, whatever you want to share, really, just so people know who you are and where you're coming from. Well, I have a very varied background. Uh, academically, I studied electronics initially, and uh, I dropped out because I didn't like digital electronics. And then I played in rock in rock music for years and for a few for a while, and then I dropped out of that and studied graphic design and worked in New York mostly. And then that went, I lived a pretty normal, straightforward, I did things like stand-up comedy and things like that over the years. And then I, I decided that 
show an interest kind of in serial killers. I wrote a book about psychopaths, but in the uh, not violent psychopaths, the ones I'd inc- encountered in big business, and how they how that pathology affects the world we live in. And on top of that, I've already I've always been interested in things like the cult, very much so. I still I still am. And that, looking back at that, that comes down my kind of artistic background. And I've always been interested in things like 14 issues and stuff like that as a hobby. Now, one of the reasons I moved back to Ireland was because I missed the history here. And specifically where I live in County Sligo, I'm, there's 5,000 megaliths just in this county alone. And one of my hobbies has always been to go to these what they call sacred sites, not just in Ireland, but all over Britain and Europe and so on. And... What what was initially kind of a lifelong kind of hobby? Like you'd go to like people. Some people would go to see say, see steam trains, or they would go to see uh, you know sort of various kind of sites or climb mountains or things like that. I found that the more I visited these sites, the more they intrigued me on. And I hate to use this word a spiritual level. Because I'm still not quite sure what that term means. It's thrown around very loosely, I think. But I found that there was a, an element of, shall we say, unspoken forces about a lot of megalithic sites. Now, not all of them. In fact, a lot of the Irish ones, are, I would call them energetically dead. And we can get into the reasons for that later. And then it sort of struck me that, well how come no one's ever spoken about this in terms of the occult? But what can you say about a bunch of dead stones, really? You know, like, even if the experts just don't know anything about them, where do you start? Well, one place you can start is in rock art, on the artwork on them. And that's always a good way, because I'm a firm believer that just like we had symbolist painters today, we had symbolist rock artists in the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. That's one thing. But the real catalyst for me was mythology, because I started to study, and anyone who's read my books, even my books on psychopathology, and all, even my books, all my books to this point, I've often mentioned my my importance that I place upon mythology. And I also mention specific individuals like Carl Jung and his work into analytical psychology, and Joseph Campbell. And the two of them have always been a constant in my own, all my work. They allowed, they, they gave me almost like a pair of 3D glasses to see things on the subconscious level. And then, so anyway, I was looking at these megaliths and thinking to myself, well, how come this has never been applied to this? This would have been about, I started to think this about 2009. I visited Karen Moore here in Sligo, and I started to think, you know, instead of a pile of stones and a bunch of graves, what can the mythology tell us about this place? And what I found out was that it told us nothing about Caramore. And then I started to dig deeper into Caramore and found out that it was, it was determined to be far older than most megalithic sites in Ireland. Some of the dating put it at near 10,000 years old. But that would make it among the oldest buildings and oldest structures on Earth. What are the oldest structures and oldest buildings on Earth doing on the far fringes of Europe when they tell us that all civilization came out of Babylon and the Middle East and Sumer? It defies that story to begin with. So then, why doesn't it have mythology? I want to know why that area didn't have mythology, yet all the the mountains around it, Nochna Ray, Mulgadi Hill, Nochna Shea, all contain megaliths that have names and stories connected to them regarding mythical people, mythical individuals such as Queen Maeve and other stories. And that became the Druid Code. What is that why did this exist? Why does one the lower areas near sea level not have a mythology, and the ones that are bu- above sea level do? And then as that did it dawn on me, they were built by two different cultures, and what caused that? What was there some kind of catastrophe in the past? So I suppose following on from the Velikovsky kind of model of catastrophism, I started to look at the Irish mythology and other mythologies around Europe, right up as far as the Norse mythology, and started to see that there was a story here a code that was unraveled. And that's what I hope to achieve and what I say that set out in this book. I came to the conclusions that the Atlantis myth, whatever we want to call it, something happened. It def- and I, This is a turnaround for me because I used to not believe in it. Not be- I used to think a Plato story was some kind of allegory for something else. 
I believe that the Atlantis myth, ha the Atlantis myth, whatever that was, took place. There was a catastrophe that sterilized particularly Ireland and Orkney about 6,000 years ago. That was the first series of megaliths were taken out. The second wave of people came in and built different megaliths. And from that, an early proto-shamanic culture rose that gave birth to the Druids. And the Druids probably became the sort of like psycho, psycho, uh, psychoanalysis of their day. And they probably healed this society. And then I started to see this healing, which is not only common to this part of the world, in that mythology. And then that became, then the catalyst grew from there. And from that point on, suddenly it dawned on me that we were looking at a very, very sophisticated ancient ancestry to these islands and what they call the megalithic arc of Europe. Far more, shall we say, diverse and eclectic and deep and profound than looking for pie in, you know, Stonehenge stones or anything like that. We were dehumanizing these people. And I always, something I always felt very, very very annoyed about is where they say well, like aliens built them and all these kinds of things. No, our ancestors built them and our ancestors were extremely sophisticated people. And so it was a combination of giving our ancient ancestors back their due respect and coupled with throwing in my own piece of the Atlantis mystery, coupled with, I suppose it's very much like an encyclopedia book, the, the real meaning of you have to clear up some of the misunderstandings that's been put out there in all media about these these kinds of stories and events. That's what you're called. Okay, well, that's a pretty good overview of the book, and in doing that, you've picked out a number of points that I want to get into in some depth as we move through this. Perhaps the first thing to pick up on is you talked about the importance of symbolism, and perhaps we could say something terms of just what you've been talking about a little bit more about the importance of symbolism mythology in terms of meaning and purpose and preserving the meaning and purpose and then kind of transmitting that forward into the future particularly through times when uh perhaps that's meaning and purpose has been sought to be hidden uh be covered up or perhaps you know deliberately hidden in order to protect it just the role of this, uh, which goes way beyond language into um, just much deeper depths of you know, is psyche, the right word, but just collective unconscious, whatever you want to use, but just something like a thread that seems to run through our consciousness. Well, in the introduction to Carl Jung's Man and the Symbols, he wrote a chapter called An, An Approach in the Unconscious, and he gives the best description of what a difference between a symbol and a sign is. A sign just tells you where something is, like a speed limit or a directional or men's room bathroom. That's a sign. It tells you about what, what a location or a, a, a behavior should be. A symbol is something else. A symbol is a shape or a, a, a marking or, or a glyph of some kind that only those who are aware of its conventions understand what it means so for instance you go around the world you see a men's you see public toilets you see a picture of a man and a picture of a female kind of in a skirt and that you know one is men and one is women now if you didn't if you were naked if humans never had clothes we wouldn't know which was which for instance uh, so and so that's you know you see the mcdonald's arches the two yellow left the yellow m with the two arches you know right away a certain type of food is available in that location, whether you want to call a food, in that location. And that's the understanding of a symbol, the awareness of the conventions of its meaning. But that's also a very powerful tool if you know how to use it in such a way that you can create a lexicon of visual imagery that's only known to a certain t type of individual. Now, where did this come from? Where did these ideas first arise? If you look in terms of Paleolithic man, the earlier Paleolithic people and their own cave work, such as at, uh, artwork, such as caves at, like Lacau and such in France, these people were very accomplished, beautiful artists, often using simulacras, you know, rocks or something shaped like a certain part of an animal and then completing it with yellow ochre and soot and so on and creating quite beautiful imagery, but very descriptive very straightforward imagery of bisons and so on and other animals and that they lived at the time. The Neolithic, something more interesting seemed to happen. Suddenly that all stopped and we started getting what is almost like the Neolithic library. Things such as a cross symbol, circles, dots, 
spirals, wavy lines. These started to appear about this time. Now, there, what that suggests is there was some kind of cognitive growth in, in humans where they didn't need such a pictorial, literal transmission of information that the symbol was enough. And the, the conventions of symbology had, had developed in human cognition to the point where some were using it. Now, this became very apparent for me in some of the megalithic structures in Ireland where the actual on certain days, such as in the equinox at Loch Crew at Cairn T in Ireland, the sun actually lights up a specific symbol on the wall. Now you're looking at something quite different. First, you have the symbol that means something. It has a convention that only the initiates or someone who's familiar with that symbol knows what it means. When you have an, when you have it, shall we say, an element of religiosity or sanctified in a kind of a cosmic sense by sunlight striking that symbol, what you have then is magic. You have a magical idea because this is more than just a symbol. This is a symbol that has a specific meaning, but it's also related to the cosmic cycles of the earth. And that was brought about through a study of astronomy and a study of the seasons through science, which is basically what, what, what magic is. It's art and science in order to determine an outcome. And you then have a quantum leap in human cognition towards understanding. From this, you build things such as imagination. The, you, the, the subconscious becomes to develop much more deeply. The collective unconscious becomes a much more powerful idea. And then you have, then you have the development of priest classes or classes and castes within society who may have awareness of certain types of symbols that others don't. And that was continued on through history from the right through to the Freemasons, was well, from the Gnostics to the Freemasons, even onto hobos in the United States during the Depression, all the way up to, to secret codes and ciphers. And that began in the Neolithic period, for some reason, about five, 6,000 years ago. I'm sure that I uh, read some mention in one of your... Um footnote or something that you read uh, Julian Jane's book um, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind yeah. um, I th I first picked that up in like 91, 92 something like that and I thought it came out then it might have come out earlier but I remember at the time thinking that was quite a revelation started to find it a bit unsatisfactory afterwards just in terms of you know, of the development of, of consciousness, particularly the, it's what seemed to be a more of a, a of, of a collective feeling of how humans once lived. And then yeah. it started to become more individuated. And we might be in a situation where not talking about anything Borg like here, but there might be, I don't know, moving both upwards, but also together once again in more of a, I don't know, of a collective sense of consciousness, collective experience of consciousness. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I, I guess my the boil down point from that is that I, I went through this phase of thinking that he kind of had it, and then I found it vaguely unsatisfactory. And I, I think I found it to be too simplistic because it seemed to play into an idea of the development of human consciousness that just fitted in with basic ideas about evolution. That is to say that, you know, consciousness developed out of a, a pile of mud for no reason, for no purpose. And that, at some point, didn't seem to sit well with me as I followed the development of what I saw around me in human consciousness and what I felt in myself, even going through my own relatively short span on the Earth so far. It just suddenly it seemed to fall away and kind of like, oh, that's that's a bit of the picture, but it's kind of like it, it's just a tiny little piece of a jigsaw, really, as opposed to the answer. No, I think you made up an important point. When when Jane's brought out that book, The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of Bicameral Mind, that was in the seventies, so it was quite, you know, far far ahead of its time in its initial thrust. But, but you know, his basic suggestion that Neolithic people experienced reality in a completely different way to ourselves would make all comparisons theoretical in that you know, scientists today could not get inside the mind of a Neolithic person. This was the, this, I think that was what the point Julian James was trying to make. And that I agree with. 
that it's no point trying to get a 21st or a 20th century consciousness into a Neolithic mind because the development of their minds is quite different. Even though they had a full brain and everything, we're talking about the actual levels of the consciousness, the subconscious, the psyche, whatever you want to call it, may have been very different. And they may have had a different kind of brain. In fact, they probably did. If you talk, if you look, let's talk about in terms of things like free association where, you know, you have people like Jung, uh, Freud talk about this idea of free association. It seems to have been common among humans before 2500 BC where maybe humans didn't even communicate like we do through language. You know, anyone who a, has a dog, you can talk to a dog literally by your face. You know, you can tell by how much facial expressions convey, how many of the, how many emotions and, you know, various gestures are con- are conveyed in the fa- in facial expressions or just by the idea of nods and winks interesting freemasonic term there that can be conveyed without actual literal language this is what after 2500 bc something seems to have happened where humans became less shall we say determined by free association we had they had a greater developed subconscious mind the ego rapidly developed and you had the sort of the breakaway of the the collective into the individual. Now, this is a, an interesting thing all by itself, but individuality seems to have risen sometime after 2500 BC, which is also a period that has interesting changes. It was when basically the great buildings of the great building projects of ancient Egypt stopped, when the Sahara Desert became uh, desiccated and fully desert. Also, it's a time that Ireland seems to have been essentially depopulated. We know that Orkney was depopulated for about 600 years at that period. So that would be suggested to be the point that something happened in human consciousness that flipped us over. Yes, I agree with Julian James. For a time, it was ahead of it. But it was also simplistic because he was using a very kind of, a, shall we say, a scientific approach to it. But his basic thesis that ancient people were very different, I believe it's sound and solid and still stands up. Yeah, I also think you can bring this idea to bear, this concept, uh, much more recently. I've been, I've read books about medieval builders and, and architects and artists. You know, the people writing the books and commentating on it have said that even people then, that we would perhaps struggle with some of their concepts and they with ours. I'm talking about at a basic, you know, conceptual and symbolic level, and we'd be going, like, they're doing this for for what reason? Or, you know, we just, we'd have fundamental misunderstandings. And it's very easy to look at advanced civilizations that appear to have a lot of co- in common with our own. For example, like the Roman Empire, we could look back and it's popular these days to make parallels with um, the US and their kind of, you know, presence around the world, not with Imperial Rome. But, I do wonder, despite the seeming commonalities, if we were sitting down now with people from medieval times and some some Romans from that from the imperial period, what we would stumble over and what we would actually agree upon, what we we would instinctively understand as yes, this, these are my people or this is my species, you know, I get this, but also what what would be just completely baffling and incomprehensible, you know, one to the other. Yeah, and that's where. Mythology then became the, shall we say, the conduit back to that, that time. Because one thing, and it was, this was verified by a, a research program by the University of New Lisbon in Portugal and Durham University in the UK, where they put together basically a, shall we say, a, a computer model using the same kind of, uh, determination sequences that that would that they used for biology in terms of DNA and species but in flora and started to look for commonalities in ancient stories, fairy tales and mythologies. And I'm talking about things you would think that were quite modern fairy tales like Jack and the Beanstalk and so on. What they determined was that at least these stories went back as least to the Bronze Age. And this is an important factor because what we're telling us then is we now have a roadmap to the subconscious mind going back at least to the Bronze Age and maybe earlier. And that's the thing. Along with the artwork and the actual meg- megalithic sites themselves gives us the nearest cipher we will ever get to understanding these people. I'm going to throw in a quick point about something you mentioned earlier on near the top of the hour, because I think this is very important as well. In terms of trying to shift our perspective and gain a different understanding of the people and the places that 
you're focusing on. You mentioned the East to West story, Babylon, Sumer, etc., origins of civilization as we understand it. I must admit that that was something that, again, I read extensively on in, in the 1980s. I was particularly fascinated by anything that would stretch back still further and still further. And indeed, when we got back into Sumer and beyond that is when we started to hit ideas that uh, Velikovsky picked up on, you know, periods of time when it seemed to suddenly get very hazy. And then you started to hit a sort of a a bit of a wall beyond which we couldn't really see. And then everything became very mythical and talked about. And this is where, of course, all the idea of aliens comes from, I think, just from a period when, you know, talk of giants and of like, you know, chariots of fire and all the rest of it. And it all becomes completely, some would say completely symbolic. Others say, no, take it literally. But I found that fascinating. But then that too, at some point, became vaguely unsatisfactory as kind of like, that doesn't then explain these other things that I'm discovering. Because I I do think it's important for us as individuals to discover these things, however often, however many thousands or millions of times they've been discovered beforehand. If you know what I mean, it's important for us each to have this journey, I think, through this stuff and not just go, oh, well, you know, we, we, we know that. Yeah, but I, I don't know it. Do you know what I mean? And I, yeah. I found some of that, the story about origins of civilization, unsatisfactory in the same way as I did the, the situation I mentioned earlier. And in the same way that I found the out of Africa story of the origin of human beings, you know, anatomically modern human beings themselves, I still find that somehow unsatisfactory. And it's not because I'm looking for an alternative to everything. I've got no reason to do that. It's just if something doesn't ring true, then I want to find the veracity in it for myself yeah it's a uh, the thing is that the, the east to west thing is basically almost like a periodic table of history and it, it's sac- sacrosanct among academics it cannot be altered it simply cannot this is the framework it starts in sumer and works its way to the west even when they find information contrary to that they they dismiss it now there's and and, and there's a dishonesty also creeps in on many occasions. So I'll give you an ex- a, simp- a very simple example of one. The, the Celt, the so-called Celtic race, we were all grown up, grew up, I don't know how it was in Northern Ireland, but down in Southern Ireland in the schools we were told that the Celtic peoples, they started off with this thing called the Halstatt culture in somewhere in Austria, Hungary, part of the world. They, that was the first identifiable, what they call the Celtic race, through their artwork, which they call the Latin style of art. It spread out through Europe, eventually made its way to Britain and Ireland, and it hung on what they call the Celtic fringe. At, and, and the proof is the linguistics. Well, a simple cursory look at the, the linguistic record shows that to be completely false. For starters... Welsh is very different. It's almost like an Aboriginal language of these islands. So that is not even a Celtic language. It's uh, called a Celtic language only because it isn't a Romano or Anglo-Saxon language. It's not a Celtic language. It's Welsh. It's an indigenous language. Now you look at the, say, you take a language, say, such as Irish, right, or Gaelic. Now Irish has no, absolutely no linguistic connection to, say, Gaulish. Now, Gaulish is supposed to be a Celtic language spoken by the Gauls at the time of Roman Britain and was still spoken and written down in, in terms of grammar and everything up until about 200 years ago. So we still we have a good historical record of the Gaulish language. It sounds nothing and reads nothing like Irish. What does sound a lot like Irish is the, re- the language of the Basque region of Spain. Now, this suggests a commonality between these two groups and you could say of course well maybe if there was the east and west spread they got to the basque region and then made their way up to britain and ireland and particularly the west coast of ireland the the areas of like northern portugal northern spain and so on and definitely the genetic and the dna record would suggest this is true but at the same time as has been pointed out by some uh, by in recent studies you cannot the dna may tell you where, what you're related to, but it doesn't tell you the actual migration path of where it traveled from. So, for instance, we may have DNA that's common to, say, you and I as Irish people that exists in northern Italy. And we say, okay, it came from northern Italy to Ireland through these Celtic migrations. 
But that doesn't tell us that at all. That's just an assumption made upon the east-to-west migration. It could very easily be the other way around. In fact, if you look at the cultural kind of aspect of people on these islands, they've always had a destiny to travel towards the east. So it could have been brought from here to there. But it's only automatically assumed that goes from Italy to these islands because that fits the east to west migration. And I find this terribly frustrating at times. And when you meet some of these academics, the younger ones are pretty good. Now, all my life we've been told this story. The Celtic people started in, in Central Europe and they moved to these islands. And it was a big mass migration along with the Goths into the Visigoths into Spain and Portugal and so on, and all these other migrations. And guess what? I was watching a BBC documentary there from last year, and the thing that the BBC so-called scientists, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, while there probably never was a great Celtic migration to Ireland, and then began follows the next to the set. So, so all this, this these these decades of being told what was the truth is suddenly dismissed because they have no evidence to back it up. But more annoyingly, they don't offer an alternative theory, which they should be doing, rather than saying, okay, there seems to be no evidence of a Celtic migration. Suddenly, when you start looking at lots of things, and especially artwork, it starts to fall apart really quickly. We see that we're now, I can show you, I can show you rock art here from the Neolithic era and in Malta that has the Latin style of Celtic artwork that was supposed to have arisen about 350 BC in Central Europe from 6, 000, five 6,000 years ago. So there's something seriously wrong with their east to west, not only migration theories, but timelines. And it's, it's, it's like this fundamental dogma they all have. And they will not look to any other any other evidence such as mythology and so on, which does, does tell very interesting different stories. And this is, this is a great tragedy, I feel, because we live in the age where the polymath is discarded and everyone in academia is put into individualized boxes. They're told the basic dogma of the other boxes of academia and then they're told to focus within their own. There's no intercommunication. There's no universality in the universities. And this is, we are being, we are being led to a great disservice in all this because it's, we, the days of us told, we, you know, we were told all roads lead to Rome. What if all roads lead to this part of the world? How different the world would seem then? Yeah, this that point you just mentioned there uh, is really, really important. Uh, you know, the, the the everything being fenced off, ring fenced off in science and you know many other disciplines as well. At a simple level, you know, I've mentioned this so many times on the show. If you do biology. Then you, you end up doing a certain amount of chemistry, but you know, don't do too much because that's for the chemists to do. And if you're a physicist and you don't do biology, et cetera, et cetera. And where we find all the interesting material emerging, except for the sake of argument, stick with science coming when things get interdisciplinary or more importantly, when all that just goes out the window and they just focus on what's in front of them. And we have a, a, again, this comes back to the nature of our consciousness, how it's developed and where it's been. Um, only in relatively recent times, I would say, actually. It's not been the sort of consciousness we've had for the majority of what we know of as, as modern human existence, but the one that subdivides everything and categorizes and labels it and wants to have it pegged, wrapped up and done with, as it were. You know, the number of things I've heard in my life, um, it, whether it's a Celtic, you know, migration or some other, you know, talk about quantum physics. So they said, yeah, that's pretty much it, folks. And then it's like, yeah. you, you look into it and actually, no, it's not at all. They're, you know, but basically they've got no idea what's going on in so many areas. And that's, that's a reason to keep exploring from a, from, from my point of view, not to just sort of say either, oh, well, there's no point in continuing with this because we'll never know the answer or, well, let's just settle for the least worst option so that we can just, you know, call that a, a day and move on to the next thing. Yeah. They always settle for the least worst option. Always. Yeah. Yeah, just the one that fits with what's already gone. It's like um, throwing good money money after bad is the one they would use in the betting terms, isn't it? You know, basically, you're building a a, a dodgy theory on top of a dodgy theory, and at no point is it suddenly going to have a sound foundation underneath it. It's only going to get weaker and weaker. I was talking to a chap in work the other day, and he was saying, I saw a documentary, Thomas, on the TV the other night. It was very interesting. You would have liked it. They showed how they moved the giant plinths at at Baalbek. And I says, really, how'd they move them? 
Well, they they lifted the the giant obelisk off the ground, and the scientists then built two wheels on either end and rolled it like it was an axle to the location. And I was like, who said this? The scientists. And I said to him, Kieran, you're a builder. You know that that would not work for certain reasons. You couldn't get that wood that strong to hold 350 tons of stone in two wheels. And secondly, you know that that, that, like any lintel without reinforcing in the middle, the first bump they hit, it would snap in two. And he goes, oh, you're right. You know, I never thought about that. But it was because he'd been spellbound by this witchcraft, almost. The scientists believe that even a man like himself who knew better dismissed his own, his own insight into it, which would have given him, which would have debunked it immediately. Yeah, there's a lot of that as well, isn't there? Like not trusting our own instincts, even our own knowledge sometimes, your own practical hands-on experience of things. It's not that anybody like your builder friend, for example, can somehow know everything about architecture and construction, but you know enough about the basics. And yeah. if you factor in the kind of, you know, the, the fundamental laws of the uh, the world we seem to live in, such as, you know, gravity, etc., then certain outcomes follow certain actions. Yeah, but that, there's been a lot of that, hasn't there? Kind of like um, absolutely crackpot theories about how things have been done that have later... And then, and then the ridicule to you say anything else. Like, uh, there was one I saw of the Easter Island statues where these great minds from National Geographic used basically, I think it was a styrofoam one covered in cement... And it was only from like the midriff up, so something like the nipples up, just like the statues stick out of the ground. And they they proved how they moved these statues in the most ridiculous, farcical way by pulling them down a road with ropes, like wobbling them down a road with ropes. And then when I pointed out to someone online, the only problem with this is is that they, the the statues go all the way down to their feet. Yeah. And he goes, what? And it goes, they all go to, all the way down to their feet. And then he writes underneath my comment, laugh out loud. Aliens, I'm sure. Yeah, and you know what? Whether it's aliens or whether it's trying to use a bit of block and tackle or a few, you know, a bit of nifty uh, roller and uh, seesaw sort of action to try and yeah. prove how all these things were done. For me, what all that boils down to is just belittling the people that came before us. Absolutely, hmm. absolutely. Uh, I have no doubt that that's always that was one of the reasons I wrote this book. I'm sick and tired of my ancestors being your ancestors and their ancestors in this part of the world being portrayed as sort of like subhuman troglodytes who needed help, if not from if not from God, but from uh, aliens from another planet. And these people could not be capable of ingenious engineering all on their own. Exactly, exactly. Now we're going to come on to a very interesting area. For me, and obviously for you as well, we talk a little bit more about catastrophism, the idea of a flood in Atlantis. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but while we've been talking around megaliths, you know, the stones themselves, let's say a little bit more about some of the properties and the potential purpose of these sites. Because again, that's an area that has done a lot to uh, speculation around it. A lot of academia has just led to belittling of our ancestors. I mean, for example, I'll just throw two things out there. Um, I know you're not talking about Egypt, but the first thing I learned about ancient Egypt, the first thing I remember learning, was that the Great Pyramid at Giza was a tomb. And I, even then, even as a child, I remember thinking, wow, that's a lot of trouble to go to to stick a body in there. These days, you could turn that into an excellent shopping and leisure centre, you know, all that, all that space, you know, all that... Um, Bearing in mind, it would have been perhaps at one time covered in white marble with a gold capstone, you know. It would have looked like something Donald Trump would have been proud of. Yeah. And then moving on to megaliths specifically, uh, Stonehenge, you know, probably the world's most famous example of its kind. And the first thing I remember learning was, oh, yes, human sacrifice, probably. You know, that's yeah. what it was. And that's the sort of thing I took away. And if it wasn't belittling ancestors, it was certainly making them look pretty brutal really at the end of the day and of course the past was a brutal place the present is a brutal place the future may well be a brutal place different types of brutality for for different ages but to take away from all that again was just that no matter how remarkable these things might have been in terms of feats of of design building whatever there was no real intelligence behind it it was all very crude and as soon as a better way of doing things was developed and more sophisticated consciousness all of that was thrown out and just half stone circles. What would you be doing with those? I know. 
it, it, it's amazing. And and there's an awful lot of lack of bodies at these sites. Now, granted, a lot of bodies have been found at Stonehenge. So there, that has definitely been a place of burial. But that doesn't mean it was a place of the dead or sacrifice or anything. It would probably be just like people today... You know, mad sports fans want to be buried in soccer stadiums. They have ashes scattered in soccer stadiums. It could have been a symbol, a symbolic reason like that. My favorite story is uh, Professor Young, the guy, the Irish professor, quite an interesting character, I have to say. In 1957, broke into the uh, the Neolithic tomb at Nout Boyan Valley, and his his descriptions of going and discovering and opening the tomb is absolutely fantastic. I mean, he really was an old-fashioned kind of, you know, Harrison Ford kind of character scientist, you know, academic archaeologist. And he, him and his crew broke in, and he describes coming into this Neolithic chamber, and what's inside now is probably the most spectacular Neolithic art gallery that's ever been discovered anywhere and he talks about how the, he was the first person in 5,000 years to see the inside of this remarkable artwork, went down to the back of the chamber, discovered the now famous mace head made from Orkney Flint, this beautiful sculptured object, came out and declared, without finding a single body inside there, declared it a grave. Now, I, I just don't know what to do about that, I know people have met him and said off the record, he said he, he said it because he was expected to say it. But this is the whole thing again. They're told, that they're, we are told they are places of debt, of worshipping debt, the worship of ancestors, the worship of debt. And what proof do they have for this? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They just made it this meme, this trope, and they threw it out there, and it stuck, and they glued with it. There's absolutely no proof. Uh, look, one of my favorite stories as well is when back in 1699, a guy called Campbell, who owned this farm called the New Grange Estate uh, near Drogheda, was digging, was pulling stones out, had his workers pulling stones out to build a road project one day. And what does he discover? The ancient stone to the now famous Neolithic chamber of Newgrange. He declares it to be a a Norse or Viking mound, similar to the ones you have in Sweden, because he said that the ancient people of Britain and Ireland weren't that intelligent or weren't that sophisticated, so it has to be much more recent. He calls over this guy called Lund from Wales, who's an antiquarian. He takes one look at it and basically calls it a barbarous ed edifice. He uses all this kind of language, primitive, barbarous, and so on. He doesn't know what it is. He stumbles upon a local farmer. This is an incredible story called Cormac O'Neill. This guy, Cormac O'Neill, starts telling him, oh, I know what that place is. That place is, uh, was built by the Dagda, who was the good god of a group called the Tuatha Dé Danann, and it was built to venerate his son, his illegitimate son, Angus Og, the god of sexual love and poetry. And the, the guy sat there and said, that's all very interesting, and then noted, Lund noted in his book, and uh, O'Neill went on to mention something about a barbarous event in, evol involving, evol uh, involving the sun in heathen times. Now, it wasn't until the 1960s that they had actually established that the, the, the winter solstice lights up the entire chamber of Newgrange, that, that this, was the, this is when it was discovered. But this guy in 1699, this local farmer, through his local folklore, knew this. Now, what even makes that more incredible is that had been passed down as local knowledge in amongst the community for probably 5,000 years. Not 500 years, not 1,000 years, not 50 years, but 5,000 years. This guy had remembered in his family, so his ancestors had remembered. This would be like somebody in, in ancient Egypt in say the second same in say Egypt in the 1600s, having a direct memory of who built the pyramids and why, they're having and knowing all about them, and yet this is just the power of folklore and stories to retain these. Not only was Cormac O'Neill right, but hundreds of years later, his actual stories were verified by science. This just shows that the human consciousness through the through through application of mythology stores ideas far more effectively than the written word or the spoken word. Yeah, there's something 
very subject to distortion, isn't there? About I mean, the written word is interesting uh, in itself, but even language has been can be subject to corruption. And we just think of like George Orwell's 1984, for example. You know how you can over quite a short space of time literally change the meaning of words. You can reduce the vocabulary, which affects people's ability to think or people who think in terms of language which you know we all do now uh, not in terms of symbolism whereas there seems to be something about symbolism itself and and archetypes and mythology that seems to somehow re- be resistant to that in a way and, and that's ironic in itself because when many people think of mythology they think of something that itself is a distortion a distortion of something from the past that is now so warped as to be almost completely unrelated to where mm-hmm. it comes from. And further to your initial question about the, the the special qualities of these places, what was the only thing that was retained from New Grange when, the, when it was overgrown with trees and covered in sods so nobody knew it was underneath that hill was the magic of the place. There was a magic that was kept inside that mythology. And that leads, now I'm going to get a bit woo-woo here, but one of the reasons I, I, can, I can tell it when a megalithic site is has, I don't know, an, an energetic feel to it, an emotional quality to it, is when it's loved. I know that sounds weird, but it's true. I mean, I remember going to Avebury and, you know, 20 years ago, seeing all the neo-pagans and the hippies and the New Agers there, I would have kind of laughed at that, thinking oh, it was cute. It was it was twee. Now I be- I understand that their emotional and psychic engagement with places like Avebury is the reason why Avebury sings and say New Grange is dead. It's because it doesn't get the right attention. There is something in those stones. There's something in those stones, and there there it's more than just like an aesthetic, archaeological, artistic thing. There's something to them. And I've become, the more time I spent with them, the more I became aware of it. There's some of the stones seem charged, some don't. Uh, is it the properties or the qualities of the stone? Maybe. There seems to be a high propensity of quartz veins in a lot of the stones picked at megalithic sites. But not always. And yet some sites that just have regular slabs, you know, regular granite or limestone monoliths seem to have a certain energy as well. If we back to something like ley lines, I don't know. But one thing I do know, there are two things we can verify for a fact. The New Scientist magazine in 1983 went to the Royal White Stone Circle and got an engineer, an electrical engineer, to do a, an electrospectrographic survey of the, of the site. And what he determined was that there was absolutely a ripple and a charge that would go up certain stones, that the actual charge would not pass from stone to stone in the entrance part. So as you were entering into this entrance of the circle, you would not be affected by the by the the charge that bounced like a relay station from stone to stone. But more amazingly of all, he discovered that the stones generate a spiral vortex of mag- electromagnetic energy that spiral into the center of the circle, at the, the main circle at Royal Wright, and then vanish into nothing. They don't dissipate. They don't. They seem to vanish as almost into another dimension. They they just disappear. So there's definitely was that was shown in the new scientist. They reported it. That was a verified s- survey. There was a guy called Professor Philip Callahan, who spent years in Ireland studying the Irish Round Towers. Just basically started out studying them as their height, their you know their engineering capacities and so on. These famous point, these towers that are unique to Ireland that they say are Christian, which I don't believe they are. I believe they were the last remnants of the Druidic age. But what he discovered was, just by casual observation, was that grass grew much better, more fertile, and the soil was better around these round towers. There was almost like they were taking something out of the atmosphere around them, and it was charging the soil and energizing it. And he, no, he started talking to farmers, again, local farmers, and at Dervinish Island, which is in Lower Loch Erin in County Fermanagh, he, 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 was, he noticed that the farmers would actually take the cows to the island, either swim them across or bring them in boats, in order to feed them on the grass, specifically around the round towers, because the farmers said, 
they had a higher milk gain, a higher beef yield, and the cows would not get infections or colds. So there's something to the stones. Now, I have found stones, like this one in Car- a place called Carriage from Asset Bay in County Mayo here, where there's a beautiful bay with a standing stone that's just beautiful standing on its own, men here as they call them. And, I, and while I was measuring it and doing my little sort of like geeky analytical kind of study of it, I was reaching around it to grab a measuring tape and I noticed a distinct sensation of an electrical charge on the soft underarms of, you know, on my arms, a soft area underneath where, where the bottom of your arms would be. I distinctly felt it and I felt it changing for up and down the stone. And that became an amazing moment for me because then I started to realize that these things are some kind of accumulators. Maybe something like what William Reich was on about with the, William Reich with the orgon kind of energy. Did our ancient ancestors know this? Well, I started to do these kind of like, I know it's very kind of, it's not scientific. But it's like tuning a musical instrument isn't really scientific when it comes down to it. There's fellas and women who can tune a musical instrument to perfect pitch without having to like rely on knowing the initial, you know, note of an A or something like that. And I'm becoming, I'm noticing that certain sites do have these energies and it seems that they respond to human consciousness as out there as that sounds, that there's something about many of these stones where they're positioned and generally how they're treated. Now, I know it sounds like that they, that people love them. I mean, if there's a respectfulness towards them, they seem to have a higher version of this charge. And this ties into things like fairy forts and how in Ireland and other countries like in Iceland and the Isle of Man and Scotland that you never, ever damage an ancient megalithic site because it will bring horrific bad luck upon you. The fairies or whatever will come after you. But it's almost like, there's a not, it's these these megalithic sites are almost like they're temples. Yes, they may be places of astronomical observatories. Absolutely, they are no doubt about that. But on top of all that, they're also a form of magical technology, a magical technology that is very, very real. And even after five, 6,000 years, many of them still have it. I could only imagine what it was like back in their day. I can't explain the, in a scientific terms, and, and a lot part of me as an artist doesn't want to, doesn't want to explain it. But what I will tell you this is, Greg, that there's no way you're going to go around with a slide rule and a scientific calculator looking for pi and all these classical ideas and all these reduction of science ideas that's a mistake again we have to go back to the basic idea of what our ancient ancestors were on about and what they were interested in perhaps just just like just like in babylon they built phenomenal irrigation systems and great and ancient egypt phenomenal edu- uh, irrigation systems built huge farms and did that that's one technology that's one way of producing vast agricultural output that may be the crude way perhaps our ancient neolithic ancestors had a more beautiful and subtle way and they were doing it with these stones actually plugging them into the earth like accumulators and batteries and why would we want everything to be scientific anyway i mean that's the, that's the big clarion call these days and it you know, has been for a while obviously but you know well this these ideas are unscientific well we, okay that doesn't make them bad necessarily whatever these ideas i'm not necessarily talking about your ideas here i'm just talking about you know in general if um somebody's looking to put something down it's unscientific well try applying science to poetry or or, or try a- applying it to your love life or something and see how far you get do you know what i mean it's, why does yeah. everything have to be scientific and something you said there made me think about, well, look, okay, in terms of these sites responding, okay, you, know, you mentioned one, for example, like Avebury being loved. We we can see this at a very obvious level, and it makes sense to us in terms of how we interact with other human beings, you know, how we treat other human beings, the, the energy we send towards them. E- even for people who are ultra-materialistic reductionists, they'll accept the idea of bad vibes and that if, you know, if someone is... um for example, sent to Coventry, you know, ignored by their peers, it can have a devastating effect on them, even though physically they're not being harmed. 
So you then extend that to animals. Uh, we know how you can be cruel to animals without actually beating them or anything like that uh, by how you treat them, you know, whether you afford them affection or not, vice versa. And then I would extend that, uh, in my experience, into plants. Now, I'll just throw out here if people are interested in this. If you're at legalizefreedom.com, just type plant consci consciousness into the search box. It'll bring up some interesting material. I've spent decades growing fruit and veg for the most part. Uh, other plants as well, but the, but produce is interesting because it's for human consumption. You know, there's kind of a really a symbiotic relationship going on there beyond just pretty flowers to look at or a nice tree with, you know, attractive foliage. And I've seen it happen about, you know, talking to plants, about looking after plants beyond watering them and feeding them and all the rest of it and making sure they're not got at by predators. And I can't explain it. We don't have time here. This is not about this particular subject. But I was told this by my grandfather. You know, he was very good at growing produce. And he was something like talking to them. Just even how you feel about them. You know, whether it's just like, oh, fucking strawberries. Or, <laughs> or whether it's like your, you know, your, your, your the joy of your life. You know, your prized strawberries. You know, something that you actually wake up in the morning and, oh, I'm going to go down and see how they're doing today or whatever it happens to be. It makes a difference. Is that scientific? There might be science behind it, but it doesn't have to be scientific for it to have an effect. So I think when you talk about this energetic exchange in the context of megaliths, why not? And I know I'm making a long point here, but you mentioned quartz earlier as a component of some of the stones. And then, of course, we're thinking of quartz crystal. We start to think yeah. about energy and crystals. And yeah. that then takes me on to properties of the stone itself. And you mentioned electromagnetism and on and on there. And fr from there, I do what I always do in these situations, which is get into popular culture. And I start thinking about uh, the film Halloween 3, where there was this powerful charge in the stones at Stonehenge that was turned to incredibly negative use. But that was the intention, again, of the person behind that. I think of Nigel Neal's stone tape. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Of um, no. deaths occurring in a place and terrible, terrible events being recorded in the stone of a building that they then, these scientists discovered a way to play back, as it were. So all of my long points here, I don't know how many of those different bits you care to draw out, but there's there's something to this. And it's just energy at every level. And why wouldn't it work at the level you're talking about? Two things that appear to be very far apart. You and I, flesh and blood, and right down to stone. Something that most people would perceive as utterly inert, dead, and in no way part of any sort of consciousness. The last thing you mentioned about the stones in the building recording the events in the past, that's actually a scientific process. Well, a method of science project process called psychometry or psychometry and uh, I'm actually working on another book at the moment about a, a sort of a Scottish aristocrat named John Foster Forbes who developed a, psycho a psycho psychotronic version of the megalithic uh, map of Britain along with these other interesting people in the 1920s one of them was a woman by the name Mrs. Pixley of all names it, it's, when you read this story it's brilliant it's like almost like an Agatha Christie novel and it was, it's, it's one of these things that only sort of British eccentrics could do and she could put she was called the human television set and she could put her hands on megaliths and and almost channel or have visions of what was stored inside that stone. So it's interesting you brought that one up. I know I've met a woman here, an American woman here called uh, Juliet Nyland. She wrote a book called, uh, oh, it'll come to me in a second, She wrote A Legacy of Wisdom, a very interesting book. And she has had similar experiences where she's just like meditating on certain megalithic structures such as Queen Maeve's Cairn. Well, that's what it's called, and the top of Knocknaray Mountain, Sligo. And she was actually able to see what was inside there, and she described it as being very similar to us uh, to the neg the Neolithic artwork inside uh, Nouth in County Mead. So that's this is actually something that people ha can do. It, I can't do it. It seems to be a thing women seem to be better at, maybe because they're they're tuned in differently to these things, but. It's a very interesting idea, and it's one that, I say, 10 years ago I would have laughed at, even though I was a 40, and not a laugh at, but I would have found it hard to believe. But one, I'm becoming highly, highly uh, interested in, to the point where 
it, I, it's, I think there is some merit to the idea. Look, you look at the work of someone like Anthony Peake or people like that, but, you know, a, a Dr. Emoto, the subatomic world does contain consciousness it absolutely does you know we can see that why wouldn't stones have a memory now this was personally this was brought home to me in this one place carol up in the mountains here in sligo the first cairn i cannot go into it it frightens me does this i have a, a, a sense of i am not i'm not claustrophobic i can climb into the deepest tunnels under the ground where there's barely any room i've done it right like like Owen oh, the Gat Cave, and I've gone right down into the bottom of it, and other places like that. And I'm not afraid of that. And this one cairn, I cannot go into because it terrifies me. Don't ask me why. There's just something about it. But I immediately told, do not enter. That's immediate. Maybe that's my memory. Maybe, who knows, reincarnation, an ancestral biological memory of someone that, something that happened to one of my ancestors there. I don't know. But it's just that I'm becoming, uh, th- yeah, these stones are living. These, th- th- what Druids used to believe that stones and rippers and everything had souls and spirits. Now, why not? I mean, I've, I've been in places like Avebury when they're sitting there and, the, and when the sun has gone down, it'd be nice and quiet and no one around. And the sunlight would catch the stone from a certain way. It would illuminate the sig- simulacras upon the surface and suddenly you would see a personality in what seemed like an inert piece of rock i've been to stonehenge early in the morning inside the circle uh for the for the documentary series megalithic odyssey that i'm filming and when i stood inside that circle i was not prepared for the dazzling array of colors that moved across the stones caused by the rising sun these are things that they're never stressed i took photographs of it Yes, there's multiple colors in those stones that are illuminated by the sunrise. Yeah, how many people talk about this with Stonehenge? And suddenly, you don't see a stone. You see something that has an energy force to it. And what's the next thing from that? It had consciousness, or our consciousness connected to that energy force, and on and on and on. And yes, it's definitely real. It's perceptible. It's there for anyone, just like if, it's a con- if you can read the conventions of that, you can engage with it. But the thing is that you, I mean, it's very easy for me to say, you've got to go there with an open mind. You see, you can say that about anything. Like, you've got to enter a religion with an open mind, and then you'll accept it. It's not like that at all. You've just got to go there. I, I bring people to these megalithic sites, and I just, I'll, I'll give them a little spiel on the way in. And then I won't say anything while I'm in there. I will let the stones talk to them. And they do. They do talk to your subconscious mind. Yes, they may be ancient observatories. Yes, they may be in ancient temples, whatever. But they're, they're, there's something to them, stones. They're not, they're not just architecture. I'll just throw out, actually, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you said you hadn't seen the stone tape. I'll just recommend that to you and also to <laughs> listeners. It was a 1970s British TV production. It was originally broadcast on Christmas Eve, oddly enough. And it's a very, very creepy story. And I think they deliberately put it out on Christmas Eve as an alternative to all the other stuff that normally goes out around that time. I I think, if I remember rightly, the writer, uh, if not co-writer, it was involved was a guy called Nigel Neal, who wrote the Quatermass stuff. Uh, that would be right up the street then, yeah. Yeah, and oddly enough, he also wrote the screenplay or developed the story for Halloween 3, the one I mentioned earlier about using yeah. Stonehenge. So that's all very interesting. But I think the, it came out on DVD a while ago. I think the British Film Institute did it. But anyway, I think you'd enjoy that. But just to pick up on something you said about that cairn that you didn't, that you just had a bad feeling about. I just want to extend this again. I know it, it takes, I think it doesn't necessarily take away from that your work here on Megalus and what we're discussing, but it might add an interesting wrinkle. And that is to think about the building and architecture over the years, but particularly where we are these days with our modern built environment, because I'm a bit of an architecture geek, a bit bit obsessed with trying to shoehorn architecture into every conceivable conversation, because I think it has great relevance. And I watched a, a documentary online, I don't remember who made it, or, or when it was, or really anything much about it, but I, because I didn't watch the whole thing, but you know how we consume information these days, it can be a bit like that, dipping in and out of things. But the, the upshot of it was, this guy was exploring the energy of buildings, and he had managed to produce some sort of, it wasn't infrared, but some sort of filming technique, and he was basically producing images of buildings 
uh, film images that were reflecting different colors back. They were give different gradients of colors based on the energy. I'm not talking about like heat, you know, sensitive film or anything like that. But his whole stick was that buildings had energy. And I absolutely believe that. And I think that we have ourselves, not necessarily by design, because it's probably a lack of design, but by default, put ourselves in a built environment that's very often very negative. Um, not, not sort of malign, but just sort of, you know, uh, a lazy sort of an approach to how the, the environment we, the things we surround ourselves with that can be very draining, very dispiriting, very unnourishing to kind of the human, human spirit, very sapping of consciousness, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why wouldn't a building have a, an energetic charge or, or, or a spectrum? Uh, it's, why is that any different than, say, a VHF, an old TV UHF antenna with an array of like, you know, different prongs and pieces of wire in different ways. That thing connected energy from the air. It, just apply that shape to, to stone, to glass, to buildings are full of wiring and so on. There's no reason why a building wouldn't have, you know, back to the quartz thing as well, a, an energetic footprint around it. It makes perfect sense to me. We've all, been in buildings where they felt lovely and in buildings where they felt shit it's just human nature we do feel them and yet you could they could be uh, often down to something as simple as the shape of the building we're putting boxes today because boxes are highly efficient for urban planners and they maximize the income potential of a space in the same way a circle doesn't like a round says as many you live in roundhouses you know so th- there's a lot of things like that we have to consider I think that's why when people saw the the Lord of the Rings movie and they saw the Hobbit houses, they were instantly charmed by them. They instantly had this feeling, I want to live in Bilbo Baggins' house. It felt naturally right. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we're living in boxes and cubes that are, that are naturally wrong. Yeah, I think there's there's a profound... That's the thing I noticed when I, I almost became an architect or I wanted to be when I was a kid. And I got that passion for it through building with Lego and in the early version of Lego 1970s it was like trying to make anything circular was almost impossible I remember they had one little brick that was a quarter circle and you could get four of those and make a circle but they were tiny you couldn't do anything of any scale they had no circular windows for Lego and for me that's not just circles but even triangles you know even uh, non-specific shapes that aren't geometric and yep. uh that's i think that's very significant and i think a lot of it is just maximizing space as you say but well, we're, fl- we're flying off topic here but i'm glad you brought up lego do you remember if, if you had a horn or a model train as a child the hypnotic quality of watching the electric train go around that metal track oh yeah because it's sit there for hours and hours almost meditating upon it yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. It's amazing. And it was a circle and it was filled with electromagnet- electromagnetic energy. Even though it was a model of a little steam train going around the track, it was hypnotic for lots of reasons. And that's, we remember these things from, from, do you remember the, the game Spirograph where you oh, actually yeah. had, there you go. But Lego play good, I think it believes it means in Danish or something like that. That was the Babylon mind. That was the box. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, even building even building a pyramid with Lego, you ended up with a step pyramid, you know, like the ones in yeah. uh, in in, uh, in Central America, in Mexico. So yeah. it wasn't the same <laughs> at all. But and then, as soon as you finish, you instantly broke it up and built something else. Well, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You would never keep it for posterity. There was no hypnotic or magic. But those, how many people preserve their Lego creations? Almost no, just shops that display the potential. Yeah, there's something, again, we're, we're, we're touching upon something here that we could go into probably and do a whole hour on, but just circles, you know what I mean? Maybe that's something to look at for the future. Maybe maybe somebody's written a, a book about circles and, and their importance and things, but it's just whether it's the, you know, a rubrous or whatever it happens to be. Just well, cir- the oldest structure that humans have ever created now is a, was a, a Neanderthal circle made from stagmites inside a cave in a circle, two, two interlaced circles. So the first shape that human beings ever made was a circle. Yeah, um, I, w- what does that say to you symbolically? For me, it before I could understand it, and this is what again that you know the rubros that I mentioned. This is what it stands for. It wasn't wasn't necessarily to do with the sun, but the first thing I grasped 
archetypally without having any, without even being uh, conscious of it in a waking sense, was that that it that this does not end. What what you know, it's it's a cycle. Yep. Now, when I say it's a cycle, what did I mean? I don't know. This is probably something I was by looking at early books I got on magic. You know, when I was twelve or something, I shouldn't have had these things, and I was looking at circles. And again, what does this mean? What in my understanding, maybe years later thinking back, was that's what it's telling you. It isn't like it goes from A, it doesn't go from A to B. It, you know, it never stops. So it, I don't really, again, even as I'm saying it now, it's starting to, it's starting to sound like nonsense, but I, that's because I don't have to explain it. I, it's just, it means something. Well, let me throw in a different aspect of that. When you have a circle, what you have is a demarcation line between two different realities. You have the beginning of two different states of consciousness and one, two different states of awareness inside the circle, outside the circle. The demarcation line is very specific. Being an artist, I'm very aware of negative spaces. So when I went to Stonehenge, I was just as much fascinated by the negative spaces in and between the Saracen stones the little boxes, the doorways of the windows, as I was the actual stones themselves, as I was the actual circle themselves. This is the idea of the magic circle. This is where the magic and the megaliths come in to this point. The circle has the continuous line around the outside. It is the perpetual and eternal demarcation. However, we're missing the other half of the show. The show takes place on the inside of the circle. So if you develop a kind of an early religion, you go, it just like the, the, the Druids later on went into the hole, the grove in the middle of the woods. If you create a magic circle, a stone of megalithic, a, a megalithic stone circle, you enter inside it, you're now in a different reality where the conventions could be different, where the rules could be different, where there's a different version of what goes on there from the, the outside. And these are very deep and powerful ideas that go, you know, right to the heart of the human condition and what we are as people. But I believe that the circle, the four circles built by those Neanderthal people in France was the first expression of the sacred space, an area outside this reality, inside the middle of the circle, and as you pointed out, the perpetual, eternal demarcation line forming the circumference. This would have been a quantum leap in cognition for the early humans, big time, to actually come up with these ideas. Earlier you were talking about uh, looking for, uh, you know, finding uh, pi in, uh, in megalithic sites, you know, pi and other mathematical relationships, and a lot has been written about that, and I've, I've done an entire, at least one entire show just all about that. And it's, you know, it was very interesting just seeing parallels and patterns showing up. Uh, but you do have the expression in, in your book, Archaeology Without Mythology, and of course that's, a, from your perspective, is a really key component that's missing if we try and look at these sites and understand them from a purely scientific point of view. Now, earlier you mentioned ley lines, and that thinking about things from an energetic point of view. So I think that in all of this, in terms of the positioning of these sites, um, not just locally and in terms of their design, but maybe one site in relation to another, again, this is another whole show in itself, but what your research over the years or your, what your instincts or what your spidey sense tells you about this subject, but there does seem to be, there do seem to be relationships here, meaningful ones that may correspond with and overlap with some of what make sense in our current mathematical understanding, but that doesn't necessarily mean, does it, that that was, was what was motivating the designers, you know, the originators of these yeah. things? I'm conv completely convinced that ley lines exist, or something along the line of idea of ley lines existing on a localized level. Now, explain the reason why that is compared to, like, a greater geographic level. You can say, you go, say, Avebury, you can go to the two center circles, the, and you, you, then you follow up the avenue over Silbury Hill, sorry, over Windmill Hill. You look across the Silbury Hill and then up to West Kennet Long Barrel. There's, that, there's definitely a sense of a natural progression in that landscape of an energetic force that you, that guides you along like our little electric train along the train tracks earlier on. In the same kind of idea, there's even an avenue of stones on either side. You get a place like Karnak in France too. Yeah, you do get that. 
where the ley line thing for me falls down is that someone, if you look at them, they've drawn straight lines across maps, right? So, so you'd have like the Michael and Mary ley line, and then you'd have the other ley lines in it, particularly they're very popular in the south of England. But there's one specific problem. They only work on a flat map. As soon as you apply the curvature of the earth, that straight line no longer exists be between the start and end point. That then becomes a curve. And yes, so that throws the idea of cross-country, vast distance ley lines right off, unless someone gets out Google Earth and starts plotting, say, between the start of a ley line and the end of a ley line, and then follow correctly following the curvature of the earth that will create an arc rather than a straight line across the two or the hundred miles or so. Maybe indeed they may find, you know specific items or markers along that curve. That's one of the reasons the whole ley line thing falls down for me, over a wide ranging area. But over a, over a, a localized geographic area, I've absolutely no doubt about it. Yeah, there's something about it. You can feel, you can see, you can sense them. They not only work, like you see at Stonehenge, there's definitely a sense of connectivity between, say, the Dorrington Walls, Woodhenge, and Stonehenge. It's the something you you're not, you know you're on a natural flux of energy in the same way. Now, why do we always assume they go in straight lines? Do rivers run in straight lines? They don't. They follow the, the lay of the land. So why why do we always have this, this sort of like you know classical science mind? Oh, it has to be a dead straight line. Why? Why why do we have that's like finding pi again? Our answer is no interest in pi. They did, they did, they built these things without classical Greek, Greek or Roman rules. So I feel the same way about the ley lines. I think the ley lines, if they exist, and I do believe they do, but, but if they exist over a wider level, they will flow like river courses. They will meander energetically through the countryside and they will not follow classical dead straight lines. No, that makes a lot of sense. It, it did, it popped into my head actually when you mentioned Google Earth. The, the show I did about this was with a guy called Mark Vidler. And the, his book was called Sacred Geometry of the Earth. And I did bring this up and he did address, and his book does address the point that, uh, rather that the work that they're, the, the lines that they've charted, how shall I put it, take into account the curvature of the earth. And yeah. he's then saying, well, if these lines make sense connecting these sites, allowing for the curvature of the earth, how could the builders of the sites or whatever have taken this into account uh, without the benefit of being able to see the Earth from the sky, which is what you need. The Hibs and his partner's work are, is a little bit different because they're also very interested actually in the Earth itself, not just what we built on it, but yeah. in terms of like naturally occurring formations and where they show up connections between them, you know, things that are not man-made, but things that, that men have apparently, the humans have said, oh, look at this. And then look at this, so natural sites that they have then constructed their own man-made sites on as a way of marking the significance of them. So, again, discussion for another day, but that's a whole other thing in itself. It, you know, the Earth itself being somehow part of this um, energetic pattern, you know, as above, so below, which we've generally been discussing. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think that ties in very well with this subject. There's no reason why there wasn't probably an already a significance in terms of maybe energy or something, a spring or something, at the site where the initial megalith was constructed. And this is probably why the same reason why Christian churches were later built upon them. Mm -hmm. Up in, in, Uppsala, in, uh, in Uppsala in Sweden, you have a remarkable series of mounds that run across the landscape. In fact, it's one of the prime sites in the world for the study of geomancy. And these lines all end up at a Christian church. Now, they're not specifically following a direct course along the landscape, but they wouldn't be built in this, in this shape or this, 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 you know, progression if it wasn't for a real natural reason. And they end upon, today it's a Christian church. Originally it was a, 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 a heathen temple. So yeah, I think there's definitely something to that. That could be, the, there could be the primary aspect of the site itself having a special natural energetic quality. And that, you know, that makes sense. And then you have the Neolithic people come along. They build their thing upon it. Happened later with the Bronze Age. Happens later with things like the Round Towers in Ireland. And why not? You see, you have to remember, in the time before the electromagnetic, electromagnetic pollution, our ancestors, even 100 years ago, would have been able to hear a cowbell ringing in a field two miles away. You know? 
they would have been able to hear a lamb bleating on the other side of a mountain. They would have been aware of the rustling of the wind in the trees, smell, sense, smells, certain vibrations of areas. In fact, is this the reason why certain areas that in Ireland in particular, or in Iceland as well, that belong to the fairies, that you don't go into them? You know, there's the energy that's in them, not conducive to human buildings and habitation and so on. So, yeah, I think that's actually an important part, of it, even though I haven't really addressed it. But, yeah, I could, if you were to take it further back, so before the Druid Code, I think that idea makes a lot of sense. There was something, Thomas, you said earlier that really got me thinking, and it was this, along this energetic idea, and it made me start to think about something that you touched upon in the book in the early days of radio when radio waves, some researchers and scientists were thinking was offering them a glimpse of another reality, of another level of reality. And with my old uh, popular culture head on, I immediately started to think about the film Poltergeist, you know, on the TV, and about John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, where they're using television to broadcast back from the future, um, just as a medium, just as any way, any physical channel that's cropping up in our 3D reality, a way of reaching out and touching that energetically. And I love the idea of extending the electromagnetism idea that we, we've been talking about earlier, just into, spe- you know, energetic spectrums, you know, not just light, but sound as well, because that's something that, again, I think is very, very key here. Another thing I've done an entire show on is how sound would have been so important to um, Neolithic peoples and just generally um, ancient peoples around the world. And uh, that's a whole other dimension to this, which, I, again, I find, and I, I think you will as well, as, as a musician, you'd find absolutely fascinating. Yes, you can contact, connect, invoke, hear, quote-unquote, spirits, demons, and so on, using electronics. Guess how I know? Because I've done it. I know it sounds <laughs> it's going to sound preposterous to people, but I have quite a good background in analog electronics. It's one, it was one of the reasons I went to college to study and dropped out because I didn't enjoy the academic world. But one of my hobbies has always been electronics. And I've had, you bring back the crystal radio, I've had experiences over the years where I have made basically experiments that would probably, in a Christian viewpoint, put me in hell. Uh, One of them included an experiment to try and capture a demon, (laughs) which is on my YouTube channel, which has not been debunked yet using some of the electronic uh, uh, devices that, as well as a magical sigil that was made for me by a friend who's a Satanist, in order to capture at this notoriously haunted house here in Sligo that was fell apart when some th- the owner of the home brought back occult artwork and mummies and so on from ancient Egypt. The house immediately started to have phenomenal poltergeist activity, and the family soon abandoned it and it fell apart and it's it's been in ruins ever since. I went into the house, I've had bricks fly off the wall and try and attack me. It is a very strange place indeed, so myself and my friend decided to see if we could actually capture something. And we built this device using a quartz crystal and using a very, very expensive a small microphone and a digital recorder and we got something inside that jar. I don't know what it is. The idea was it was following a, a, a an ancient magical text, which is what these guys were doing back in the radio days. The entity, whatever it was, I now probably believe it was a nature spirit of sometimes. I know the sound's out there, but I'm telling you this stuff is real. And it passed through the wood could not get back out through the lead paint on the bottom because it was attracted to the sigil on the bottom. And the results are there for anyone to judge. If you can debunk it in any way, any engineer, sound engineer can debunk it, they can. But I can tell you for a fact, electronics from day one was used to open portals into what they call the spirit world, mainly because the advent of electronics and radio technology happened around the same time that the spiritualist movement was sort of at its peak the late 1800s, and remarkable devices were being developed, such as the cathode ray, not the cathode ray tube, the, the vacuum tube, which were seen as mythical, almost like chemical machines, where, you know, the electrons flowed between two metal plates inside a vacuum and produced an amplification 
an, an induction effect that is quite magical. Even today, I'm still amazed that a step-up transformer, just because two coils are wired differently, can actually increase the voltage of, of you know, on the, the output of the, vo- the coil than the other. It's creating that energy from nowhere. It's creating across a, a dead space. Now, this in the early, we can explain these things through physics today, and of course, but in the early days, this of radio, even radio, people like Marconi and Alexander Bell were driven by this need to connect spirits. And I'm glad you brought this up, because I think my reason for doing it was directly, directly because of my experience with the megaliths. I was getting a megalith, a stone, a large crystal, putting it in a sealed jar, and then using it to try and contact something from another world. I believe I did. I don't know what that thing was, but I believe I did it. I also believe this explains many things like electro, electronic vice phenomena and so on. When I was with James Swagger, in this is an amazing thing that happened. We'll see it in the documentary film when it comes out. We were in West Kennet Long Barrow in uh, near Avebury, inside, inside the chamber. And... It has these two kind of antechambers off the side when you go in. I just, as a joke, took out my guitar tuner. That's all I did. Just took it out as a joke. Uh, and it p- produced an A-tone. Right? This thing is digital. It's solid state. That It is not switched onto. It's no kind of modulation or anything. It's a solid A eh, going nonstop. As I moved it around the stones, the thing went bonkers. I had to actually shut the power off to stop it. So, yes, there's something to it. There's something. To, now, we know for a fact that when you put electromagnetic devices near humans' heads, they will start seeing things like they call aliens. They'll have kind of like entogenic experiences. You can. Ex- it, this is something that the U.S. military have surprisingly worked on, but also stopped because they were trying to make psychopathic military helmets for U.S. Navy SEALs that would t- switch off their, their compassion while in battle. And what they found out was they were having these amazing trips and saying, I saw aliens and fairies and angels and everything. So we've known this for a long time, that there's something to this. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. And we'll round out on this point until the next show. I absolutely believe 100% that these megalithic sites were portals into other realities amongst other things and they were not called portal dolmens for no reason at all the portal existed for that reason our ancestors knew it, the druids knew it the Christians knew it and they built the churches in the same way and they were built for that reason or the Christians and the Abrahamic religions crudely did it but they, they were still after the same technology, it's why they built their church spire is so high it's why they 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 employed secret orders of freemasonry freemasons that do specific inst- inst- instructions regarding archaeology such as simulating the inside of the groves of trees inside gothic cathedrals they were after an effect that our ancient ancestors achieved and that is that is something that's so powerful to me at this point are we even and i'll leave you with this one point did we even come through those portals into this reality? And I'll leave it at that. Okay, well today, Thomas, we've been talking about your latest book, amongst other things, The Druid Code, Magic, Megaliths, and Mythology. As you say, this is just part one today. We'll be back very soon for part two. But in the meantime, just tell listeners about the book, where they can get it, share your website, YouTube, anything else you want to put out there. Uh, my YouTube channel is Thomas Sheridan Arts. There's tons of stuff on that. I've started a new YouTube channel called Open Source of Cold TV where I will be doing a grown-up visit of European cities to make films on the occult architecture. You'll enjoy that, Greg. In a mature way, free from any kind of Christian hysteria or calling it satanic, to try, to try and explain to people what the Freemasons are about. I'm currently working on a film about Dublin. Uh, I've also got the upcoming documentary, Megalithic Odyssey, that's coming out next May. I'm doing, I'm at the Megalithic Odyssey seminar with people like John Anthony West and a few others next May in London. I have the Druid Code, you can get the best place to get that is directly off my website, Thomas Sheridan Arts. It's also on Amazon, but you know, don't buy direct from Amazon if you can help it. And uh, my other website dealing with pat- growing website dealing may ba- basically more with the occult is uh, streetdruid.net but the best one to go to is thomasheridanarts.com and that gives you a link to everything 
Okay, well, until next time, Thomas, thanks for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you, Greg. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, check out the website, which is LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including politics and economics, energy and environment, culture, spirituality, history, and the nature of reality. You can also browse and buy a range of publications from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Whether you listen, donate, or do both, I greatly appreciate your support. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.